Welcome to one of the most iconic buildings in New York City. Its official name is the Fuller Building, but thanks to the sharp 25-degree top corner, people began to associate the tower with a flat iron. And today, the name Flatiron is stuck both to the skyscraper and the entire district around it. This unusual cake slice shape has turned the building into a famous tourist destination. It has popped out in many movies, TV programs, and magazines. So you probably recognize this property, even if you've never been to Manhattan. Surprisingly, today the 285-foot-tall Flatiron is almost empty. And these fancy walls hide a pretty mysterious dispute between their owners. But first things first. In 1901, construction enterprise Fuller Company purchased a sharp triangular plot of land on the crossroad between Broadway and Fifth Avenue. They hired an architect from Chicago, Daniel Burnham, to design the company's new headquarters. The task was to maximize every inch of available space. So Burnham produced a project of a 22-story triangular tower made of steel. The Flatiron Building resembled the shape of a Greek column, which means that its top and bottom are slightly wider than the middle. Fuller Company approved the design and demolished several old buildings to clear the space for the future tower. Construction progressed rapidly, and it was completed within a year. Yes, they used to be able to do that. The Flatiron became one of the earliest buildings to have steel for its structural frame instead of load-bearing masonry. Also, it became one of New York's first skyscrapers and the first steel skeleton structure visible to the public. The curtain wall cladding was also then innovative. The builders used terracotta and limestone to wrap a chic finished look around the steel structure that carried the building's weight. At that time, many people believed that this unusual architecture would fail to withstand high winds. The project's engineers analyzed the tower's aerodynamics and created a steel frame to fight likely problems with the wind. But people still reported experiencing heavy gusts on the street around the building. The Flatiron Building had a bunch of other issues. As you may imagine, furnishing this tight space was quite a challenge. Also, the tower didn't originally have any bathrooms for females. That's why lady tenants were at a disadvantage at first. But then the management added ladies' rooms and placed them on odd-numbered floors. Meanwhile, bathrooms for males were placed on even-numbered floors. Also, the first elevators in the building operated on a water hydraulic system. So it took over 10 minutes to get to the top. Now you can see why that system didn't catch on. It's not surprising that the media expressed skepticism over the new building. Some even called it Burnham's Folly. But despite the naysayers over the years, the tower has been home to many companies and retail tenants. Also, the Flatiron attracted crowds of people. Gradually, it became a frequent site in paintings and postcards and turned into one of the most popular symbols of New York City itself. In 1929, during the Great Depression, the tower was sold at an auction for only $100,000. And in 1966, it got the status of an official city landmark. It means that any renovation or demolition works are impossible without the official permission of the authorities. Furthermore, in 1989, the Flatiron received the fancy status of a National Historic Landmark. The last tenants left the building in 2019, and it has sat empty ever since due to renovation works, which have triggered many disputes among the building's current owners and future tenants. Most of the owners wanted to turn the building into a hotel. Meanwhile, Nathan Silverstein, who owned a 25% stake in the property, wanted to divide it up. Finally, in 2023, the local court organized an auction on the building. The owners who held 75% intended to buy out Silverstein's stake to put an end to all disputes over the future of this building. The bid started from $50 million and the price soared to $190 million thanks to an unexpected bidder, Jacob Garlick. Surprisingly, he beat out everyone and won the auction. Some considered the price that he offered too high because the building required at least $100 million worth of renovation. Hey, it gets better. Garlic disappeared after the auction. He has never paid anything, not even the deposit. And he hasn't yet explained himself to the media. So for now, Garlic's location and intention remains unknown. Little did we know that it's possible to show up at a luxurious auction in New York 
outbid everyone, and then just vanish into space. Well, according to some experts from the real estate world, it's a very weird situation for a building auction. Usually, the bidders are asked to prove their funds in advance. Some people suspect that Silverstein asked Garlic to attend the auction on purpose, so that he could boost the price and earn more money. But Silverstein claimed that his relationship with Garlic had been distant. On May 20th, the second auction took place. Garlic was absent, but a coalition of syndicates and previous owners won the bid and acquired the Flatiron for $101 million. They haven't yet announced any plans, so today, the future of the Flatiron remains uncertain. The age of the Flatiron building is only around 121 years. But this famous and beloved symbol of New York has survived so many chapters. From challenging traditional architecture to surviving multiple crises, including the Great Depression. So, chances are that this iconic tower will surprise us in the future. Oh, by the way, the Flatiron is not the only skyscraper with issues in New York City. Here's the famous half-built Leaning Tower of Manhattan. A 670-foot skyscraper is located at the corner of South Street and Maiden Lane on the East River. The tower was to host 80 super-fancy condos to sell for up to $7 million each. The developer also planned to offer yacht services to the tenants. A pre-sale of this luxurious but unfinished project was launched in 2018. But in 2020, the tower began to lean 3 inches to the north. The developer put construction on hold and initiated a huge investigation to figure out why this tower refused to stay straight. Although the reason remains unclear, the consensus appears to be that a weak foundation is to blame. You think? And now, welcome to the Waldorf Astoria, a former host to authorities, royal families, and Hollywood stars. And maybe not so welcome. This Art Deco masterpiece is the very place where Marilyn Monroe once stayed and where Grace Kelly got engaged to Monaco's Prince Rainier III. But in 2017, the famous hotel was closed for a multi-billion dollar renovation. The property's new Chinese owners, Anbang Insurance, plan to partially turn the hotel rooms into condo apartments by 2019. The condo price was planned to reach up to $18 million per unit. But eventually, something went wrong, and the date of the project completion was postponed until 2025 at best. Although, according to the media, the renovation might have already cost around 2 billion bucks. Some insiders mentioned poor coordination within the project caused by the dismissal of its American director. They also blamed the property's new owner, Dajia Insurance Group, which took over the project after the chairman of Ambang was sent to prison for fraud in 2018. To date, the future of the Waldorf Astoria remains unclear. So I'd try another hotel if you're visiting the Big Apple. And here's another heartbreak hotel story. In 2019, a development firm, Chetrick Group, launched the construction of a 33-story hotel near Madison Square Garden and Penn Station. The project was supposed to open in 2021 and join the management portfolio of IHG Hotels and Resorts, which runs multiple hotels. However, the developer failed to either repay its loan or complete the construction on time. Meanwhile, the hotel remains unfinished, and the estimated investment for its completion totals around $106 million. Hey, you want to finish the job? Well, looky here! It's New York City, the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps, Hong Kong on the Hudson, the greatest city in the world, New York, New York, the city so nice they named it twice. All right, I'll stop. You thought you knew this city so well, but underneath all that glitz and glamour is a facade, literally. New York is populated with some of the most iconic urban buildings in the world and home to some of the most unique and famous towers. Who would have known that New York was a front for fake buildings? And the cool thing is that there are plenty to search for. Okay, I'm adding that to my bucket list. So the question is, why do they put these fake buildings all over New York? The city is one of the most vibrant places in the world and requires many infrastructures to keep the city in motion. That means having many industrial structures and buildings in every major district. 
New York is charming for the design and the buildings. Imagine having industrial structures right next to your favorite pizza parlor or hot dog stand. The designers thought ahead and decided to disguise those industrial infrastructures as fake buildings. They blend with the city so well that they don't stand out. They look like your good old apartment or housing unit with a front door, real-life windows, and even charming balconies where people would hang out. The only thing is that there's nothing behind the facade and no one is allowed inside. So where in the world can you find these fake buildings? For starters, one of the most popular fake buildings is in Brooklyn. At 58 Giralamont Street, you can find a very typical neighborhood. But between the buildings stands a brick building with a slightly deeper shade than the rest. It has bright open windows that blend in with the rest of the buildings in the neighborhood, except that they're blacked out. At first glance, you might not think of it as anything. But if you pay close attention, the building looks like a glitch from a video game. It was built in 1847, way before New York was considered glamorous. Originally, it was meant to be a regular building, but in 1908, they converted it into a fake building. Don't think you can just try to break in. Even if you could, it's pointless, because it's part of a ventilation fan for the subway. It also serves as an emergency exit for some of the surrounding buildings. Actually, throughout New York, many fake buildings exist to disguise the subway vents for the smoke to escape. All the way to 415 Bruckner Boulevard, the Bronx, this townhouse was designed by the Switzer Group, which is an interior architect company. It's not as charming as the one at 58 Jorah Lemon Street, but it serves a similar purpose – to hide an electric substation for New York's utility company. The city needs these substations to reduce the high-voltage electricity to a lower voltage so it can be distributed locally. Having a building like this popping out of the middle of your neighborhood isn't exactly the smartest way to attract people to the Bronx. That's why the fake townhouse facade is the perfect camouflage. Now, some of these fake buildings don't really hit the mark and stick out like a sore thumb. The people of Manhattan described the Mulry Square infrastructure as a complete clunker. After plenty of redesigns and back to the drawing board meetings, the result is still not pretty. The locals compare it to a concrete box. They created windows without glass, which doesn't allow the building to blend in with the rest of the neighborhood. But it beats a typical subway ventilation plant either way. There are just so many places to visit and cross off your bucket list. But if you live in China, you can literally stay in the country and visit many iconic cities around the world. The replica cities began when the Chinese economy started booming in the early 90s. They wanted the lifestyle of the rich and famous without wanting to leave their country. They can be comfortable eating their local food and get the feeling of being abroad. The Chinese province of Guangdong has an identical copy of the historical Australian alpine village Hallstatt. The real Hallstatt is centuries old and one of the most charming places to discover. The local people of Hallstatt also had no idea that their home was being built in China. Some people thought that this was controversial, probably because it cost around $940 million to build it. Paris is undoubtedly one of the most charming cities you could ever visit. Its rich history and vibrant culture are enough to catch the first plane to go there. For residents of Tian Du Cheng, that's something they can do anytime they want. The city is also known as Sky City and has a replica of the Eiffel Tower that looks eerily like the iconic one in Paris and built buildings to match the city's visual charm. One of the main things that will break the charm is the farmland surrounding the city. There's barely anyone there, and the streets are always empty, very un-Paris-like. Still, you can find some nice fountains and statues scattered along the streets to give it some spirit. There's laundry hung everywhere, even on the trees. The picturesque fountains are dry and many apartments are empty. Only a few stores are open for business. Even though this looks like a fake city, it's quite real. Some people live here because it's more affordable than other places. Two hours away from this town is another version of Paris' Pont Alexandre III and a carbon copy of London's Tower Bridge, but with four towers instead of two. Hey, such a bargain! You can also visit the closest thing to Italy, but this time you can go shopping. Florentia Village is an outlet mall that offers an array of shops to lose yourself. 
The good thing is that this was built by an Italian developer to capture the essence of an Italian village. It has fountains, canals, and mosaics for proper aesthetics. It began in 2011 and has more than 200 shops with many Italian brands and British, US, and Chinese brands as well. The place is so popular that it gets between 10,000 and 25,000 visitors per day. China also has other replica towns that put you in a mini Manhattan called the Yuzhipu Financial District. The developer's goal was to make this place the financial center of the world. It was complete with the right landmarks, like the Rockefeller and Lincoln Centers, but the project was halted in 2019, leaving it mainly empty. You can find a typical English town with cobbled streets, Victorian homes, and restaurants that make Thames Town. This place was meant to recreate a European lifestyle fantasy without leaving Shanghai. China also has a Dutch town that has some elements of Amsterdam with windmills and famous canals. They even decided to copy some of the landmarks, like the Netherlands Maritime Museum. Here's a bonus story of Lebanon's thinnest building built out of a dispute. It's the story of two brothers who both inherited unequal plots of land. One of the brothers happened to get a very thin plot of land and couldn't help but be jealous of his brother's nice plot of land. He wasn't pleased. Both of the lands overlooked the Mediterranean Sea in a lively neighborhood of Beirut. So it's no wonder that both brothers couldn't agree on how they should develop their lands. It was obvious that the brother with the most land could build a proper building. The other brother had to improvise. He decided to obstruct his brother's property by constructing a thin building enough to only fit 14 feet at its widest and 2 feet at its most narrow. It was constructed in 1954, and the locals of the area know it as the Grudge. The crazy thing is that the place was once habitable with many visitors enjoying their stay. It's not easy to live there, but it's part of living the experience. The building is still standing, but is empty. Wow, every morning, 8.5 million people wake up in New York City. But the Big Apple doesn't belong only to humans. This is the city of ants. There are 17 billion of them here. They live in houses, hide in the grass, crawl under asphalt, and climb trees. For every New Yorker, there's a sneaker box filled with ants. City ants are more fortunate than their forest cousins. They don't have any need to look for food. Millions of people leave behind tons of hot dog crumbs, pizza slices, and coffee drips. Insects just have to wait for a lunch break in an office building. Then they gather around benches in the park or cafe tables. A lot of food is waiting for them there. Over 1 billion! That's how many ants are running through the streets and parks of Manhattan. And in this ocean of insects, scientists have been able to spot tiny reddish-brown creatures. These insects don't fit into any of the 13,000 ant species known to science. They're unique and only live in Manhattan. Their kingdom is between 63rd and 76th streets. Scientists don't know how long the Manhattans <laughs> have evolved in isolation. They arrived in the US on ships from Europe and were cut off from the rest of the city's infrastructure. But why go anywhere else if there's enough food? The Manhattan loves fast food, especially corn syrup. Because of such a diet, the insect's body has an increased carbon content. This isn't a problem for the ant, though. Carbon helps it adapt to the dry, warm weather of the concrete jungle. Around 20% of New York City is parks and green spaces. White-footed mice live in these places. Scientists have found out that the mice that live in New York have evolved. They're different from their village relatives. These changes are genetical. It's caused by the diet of white-footed rodents that feed on human food waste. For example, New York mice need enlarged livers to process fatty acids from fast food. Central Park in New York is almost twice the size of the Principality of Monaco. A unique centipede is only found in this green area. The creature, called Hoffman's Dwarf Centipede, doesn't grow any longer than 0.4 inches. It lives in heaps of dry plants and runs on 41 pairs of legs. This crustacean, measuring only a bit more than 0.3 inches, is called the Socorro isopod. It's one of the rarest animals on the planet. 
The creature can only be found in a small thermal spring near Socorro, New Mexico. The isopod lives in the water as warm as 90 degrees Fahrenheit and covered with a layer of algae. These are ideal conditions for the creature. To get to Mobile Cave, you'd have to rappel 65 feet down. That's the height of a four-story building. After that, you'd crawl through narrow passages and swim along a canal with cold water. Sunlight can't get into the cave. The air is poisoned by vapors of ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. This extreme place has been isolated from the outside world for 5.5 million years. A unique ecosystem has formed in this toxic atmosphere. Of all the animals that live there, 33 species of millipedes, scorpions, spiders, and leeches can't be found anywhere else on Earth. These creatures are mostly blind and colorless. Well, why would you need eyes in disguise if you live in complete darkness? Movile's coolest guy is the venomous centipede. Scientists have nicknamed this animal the king of the cave. It doesn't grow more than 2 inches, but for this world, it's a giant. The blind salamander would feel great in the company of strange animals from Movile. But these little monsters are separated by the ocean and thousands of miles. The Movile Cave is located in Romania, where these beauties live only in Texas. Their home is an underground body of water in the San Marcos area. These salamanders grow to be 5 inches long. The name makes it pretty clear that the animal is blind. It does have eyes, but they're pretty much useless. This doesn't stop the salamander from being a skilled snail and shrimp hunter. It senses other animals by feeling the underwater waves they create while moving. The Scottish wildcat lives in the north of Scotland. This animal is different from domestic cats, which love sleeping on the couch. Unlike them, it's a perfect hunter. The creature is 25% larger than the average cat. It's muscular and long-legged. The wildcat's tail is blunt and fluffy, covered in black rings with a black tip on the end. The quokka is called the world's happiest animal. Just look at its smile. This fluffy animal seems to always be ready for a photo shoot. Quokkas are only found in Australia. Around 10,000 animals live on Rottnest Island and several other locations. The creature's cute smile is an evolutionary trait. An open mouth helps it breathe and regulates its body temperature. Oh, by the way, if you try to feed a quokka, you'll have to pay a fine of more than 200 bucks. This baby will feel comfortable even if you put it on your little finger. The animal lives only on the island of Madagascar. Scientists have found just two tiny reptiles, a male and a female. The researchers have named the nano-chameleon Brochesia nana. It's a mystery to them why it doesn't grow larger than a sunflower seed. The next animal on the list also lives only in Madagascar. Locals call this creature Ai. The unusual lemur spends most of its life in trees and leads a nocturnal lifestyle. This might explain why it looks so tired. Even though the Ai is a lemur, its teeth are like those of a rodent. Its claws resemble sloth's claws, and its body looks like that of a monkey. The animal's fingers and toes are especially frightening. They're long and thin, with pointy claws. <laughs> Get equipped for any season with brand new Brightside merch. Click the link and grab your print. This is a giraffe with its trademark long neck. A zebra is grazing nearby. Black and white stripes on its body help the animal reflect sunlight during the day and keep it warm at night. But what if you combine these animals? No need, nature has done this work for you. The okapi looks like a giraffe with a short neck, horse body, and zebra stripes on its legs. The okapi has a long tongue. Males have small giraffe horns on their heads. You can only meet these unusual animals in the African rainforest. If you decide to travel around Africa afterward, you must visit the Ethiopian highlands. That's where you see unique gelata monkeys. And no, they're not named after the Italian ice cream. That's gelato. Don't mix that up. Males look like rock stars from the 70s. They're bright and have cool hair. But don't mess with these animals. They aren't too friendly. Gelatas spend most of their time on the ground. 
and the main part of their diet is the grass they collect during the day. Scientists believe that gelatas are the remaining members of an ancient gang of critters. It lived millions of years ago in vast spaces from South Africa to India. Now, imagine people the size of the Statue of Liberty living next to us. Sounds like science fiction. But for the animal world, this is reality. The world's smallest tortoise species, the speckled tortoise, doesn't grow more than 4 inches long. But the Galapagos Islands are home to giant tortoises that reach the length of 5 feet. They also weigh like a sports bike. The largest of them had an incredible weight of 1,000 pounds. The giant Galapagos tortoise lives for 100 years and sleeps 16 hours a day. Due to its slow metabolism, the animal may not eat or drink water for a whole year. Millions of years ago, lizards from South America climbed onto a log. Sea waves carried the log to the Pacific Ocean. The lizards traveled hundreds of miles and ended up on the Galapagos Islands. They had to evolve to adapt to new conditions. Scientists believe this is how the marine iguanas appear. These unique animals look like dangerous dragons. But in fact, they feed on plants and are totally harmless. Iguanas spend most of their lives in water. To get rid of sea salt that accumulates in the body, these animals literally sneeze salt. A chew. The lyre bird lives only in southeastern Australia and the island of Tasmania. The bird has such a strange name because of its tail. It looks like a lyre, a stringed instrument of the ancient Greeks. Lyre birds are known for their ability to imitate other birds, and not only them. The bird copies animal screams, human voices, chainsaw noises, car and fire alarms, and even the click of a camera. About 12,000 years ago, a salt lake appeared on one of Palau's islands. Today, it's called Jellyfish Lake. This 1,500 by 500 foot reservoir is home to 5 million golden jellyfish. These unique creatures swim to the west shore of the lake every morning. There, jellyfish wait for the sunrise. Then, all day long, they follow the sun. Algae lives in the tissues of the jellyfish, feeding them with energy. These algaes can't live without sunlight. Here's a riddle. Which U.S. city is so loved that its name should be repeated twice? You guessed it. New York, New York. But the thing is, how much of New York do we really know? I'm talking about the city that lies under the city. Dare to join me on an underground tour of the Big Apple? Then grab a flashlight, it's about to get dark. We'll start in the heart of Manhattan, in the front of the Romanesque City Hall building. Believe it or not, beneath our feet lies New York's oldest subway station, known as the Old City Hall Station. It opened in 1904 on October 27th, a night of true celebration for New Yorkers. People were so excited, some of them spent the entire night riding the trains back and forth. Before this, urban dwellers moved around in carriages pulled by horses. No wonder the subway was such a hit! You might feel like a time traveler stepping inside the old City Hall station. The architecture is dazzling and one of a kind. They sure don't make subway stations like this one anymore. Fun fact, the old City Hall station would cost $6.2 million if it was built today. Back in the day, it had dozens of brass chandeliers hanging around. It was one of the few spots in town with functioning electricity. And oh, not to mention brand new multicolored tiled arches and stained glass ceilings you can still see today. Impressive, huh? If you decide to wander down the tracks, you might be in for a treat. Underground New York is as fascinating as the city above the ground. But one thing we usually take for granted is the behind the scenes of what the Big Apple needs to function. Down here, you might see one or two of New York's pneumatic mail tubes. These tubes were built back in the 1800s and they were operational up until the 1950s. They were responsible for distributing people's mail through different post offices. Letters flew at an impressive speed of 35 miles per hour. That's almost as fast as a professional runner. It sure sounds like a useful system. But I have to say, it feels weird imagining people's correspondence flying around 15 feet underground. Back to street level. We'll wander around fancy Lexington and Park Avenues. If you look up, you'll see the famous Waldorf Astoria 5-star hotel. 
Many celebrities have stayed there, including John Lennon and Yoko Ono, as well as presidents such as FDR. This is why the hotel used a secret infrastructure to sneak people inside and out. Under the building, a tunnel known as Track 61 connected the Waldorf Astoria to Grand Central Station. The track was deactivated in the late 70s, but some people say Andy Warhol threw a party there in the 80s. I bet that was something. For the next part of our visit, we'll have to take the subway uptown. We'll get off at 125th Street and find ourselves on the scenic waterfront of Riverside Park. Here, you'll find abandoned tracks of an old metro line. If you follow the tracks, you'll get to an underground graffiti gallery, aka the Freedom Tunnel. The tunnel is named after a graffiti artist from the 80s, who is commonly known as Freedom. While exploring these tunnels, we'll see over 40 graffiti pieces he painted over 15 years. There are spray paints of James Dean, Mona Lisa, and even a self-portrait of Freedom himself. Moving on, let's wander around the northern part of NYC for a bit. Walking in Van Cortlandt Park will feel like hiking upstate, but believe me, you're still in the city. Along the way, you'll encounter some big ventilation towers made of stone. These towers were once part of an old New York infrastructure. They make up the remains of what used to be the Croton Aqueduct. In the 1800s, the city's water supply flowed through a 41-mile-long underground tunnel, all the way from Croton River in upstate New York to Bryant Park in midtown Manhattan. Oh yes, and I should probably tell you that Bryant Park wasn't a park. Instead, it hosted a colossal stone structure that looked pretty much like something ancient Egyptians would build. This four-acre structure served as the city's water reservoir. It even had a pathway on top so that people could enjoy a nice afternoon stroll while looking at the reservoir's crystalline water. Now, all this exploring might have made you hungry, but don't worry, our next stop includes a yummy treat. We'll have to leave Manhattan and make our way to Brooklyn. In case you didn't know, New York City is made of five boroughs, Manhattan, Queens, Bronx, Staten Island, and Brooklyn. Crown Heights, that's our stop. Would you believe me if I told you that beneath these streets lie caves full of aging cheese? How very Parisian of them. To get down there, you'll have to make your way through a century-old building that now works as an office space. Maybe wave hello to all those hard-working people and disappear in one of the stairways that will take you 30 feet below the ground. You won't need a flashlight for this one. The caves are bright and renovated and can hold up to 22,000 pounds of cheese. But hey, it might stink. That's the main reason cheesemakers decided to use underground tunnels to age cheese in the first place. After a bite or two of some delicious cheese, let's keep going. While still in Brooklyn, you might see tons of locals enjoying a sunny day in the McCarran Park Pool. This pool is a huge attraction, being three times the size of an Olympic pool. As the NYC explorer you are becoming, you might even go for a swim. But hey, there's a much more interesting part to this attraction. The pool was built in the early 1900s, but it was shut down in the 50s. During this time, urban explorers discovered a network of underground tunnels right beneath the pool. And, of course, you can find a secret entrance and get a peek for yourself. There, you'll not only see the pool's filtration and heating system, but also a lot of graffiti from the time the site was abandoned. Neat! This question may sound weird, but have you ever seen a cow in New York? I sure haven't. Well, maybe there's a reason for that. Apparently, New York still has underground tunnels that were constructed for the transportation of cattle. Once New York started to flood with automobiles, cows became a burden for traffic. Until a 200-foot-long cow passage was built below 12th Street to transport the livestock that was ferried over from New Jersey. These days, you won't be able to visit this place in person because the tunnel was most likely destroyed. But historians found blueprints proving its existence. To add to the list, archaeologists discovered a very peculiar fossil a while back. Now, imagine peeling off the layers of the city's soil. First, at 15 inches, you'll find a layer of wires. I'm talking TV cables, electricity, and all that. Digging deeper, at 4 feet, you'll see water and sewage pipes. But then, at 15 feet down under the surface of NYC, diggers have found a fossilized shipwreck. The wreck is located right under Broad Street. 
where there was once shallow water. They believe the wreck dates back to the 1600s. It's 92 feet long and 25 feet wide. Oh, and that's not all. At the intersection of Bowery and Canal Street, engineers stumbled upon a room with its walls and ceiling covered in mirrors. And no one has managed to explain the existence of this bizarre place yet. Our Big Apple underground visit is coming to an end, but we sure did more than just scratch the surface on this one. Before we finish, let's enjoy the best of what NYC cuisine has to offer, a good old bagel. Who knows, maybe next time we'll do Paris or even London. See you soon, Explorer. It's one of the most important national monuments of the United States, with over a half a million visitors each year. The Washington Monument was constructed to commemorate George Washington, the first American president. But if you've ever looked at it closely, in person, or by googling its pictures, you've surely noticed it has two different colors. Well, it's not a design choice, if that's what you're wondering. The Washington National Monument Society, the authority in charge of the construction, ran out of funding and the project was put on hold in the 1850s. It took another 25 years for the authorities to resume the construction. They finished the upper two-thirds of the monument in 1884. Since they evidently used marble from a different location, given the time that had passed, it was difficult to envision how these materials would behave in the future. These two sections look very much alike at first, but with time, mostly due to winds, rain, and erosion, they ended up having different hues. There's even a third portion of marble, which is noticeable only if you pay very close attention. The constructors initially went for a marble provider in Massachusetts, but quickly realized the colors didn't match. They had to switch to another supplier, but their mistake resulted in this third shade of marble. It's only noticeable up front, so people mostly think that the monument has two colors. The builders figured out the difference quite fast and found a type of marble that resembled the initial one. But the new material eventually turned to a different color too, mostly to weather conditions. Are you one of those people who like to spend their free time on Pinterest or Instagram in search of your next travel location? Then you surely haven't missed a little Italian town called Cinque Terre. The reason why it's so popular among photographers and globetrotters is its brightly painted buildings, which come in a nice contrast to the crystal clear ocean waters. These houses come in a huge selection of colors, from green to yellow and even bright pink. So it's no wonder this location is such a hit. It looks more like a painting than an actual place on Earth. But why are these houses so gorgeously bright? Local legends say that fishers used to paint their homes in various colors so that they could quickly spot them from the water as they came back home from the sea. Now, some other buildings come with coloring so specific that their inhabitants are prohibited from changing it by law. It's the case of the Pink City, otherwise known as Jaipur in India. It has numerous buildings of different hues of pink, from dusty rose to fuchsias. This impressive coloring dates back to the 1800s. Rumor has it that the Indian Maharaja of the time, Sawai Ram Singh, wanted to welcome Prince Albert during his visit. So he literally painted the whole town pink. Which, of course, begs the question, why he chose pink and not any other color? And it turns out this hue was meant to subtly imply the idea of a welcoming location or a place of hospitality. Jaipur isn't the only monochrome city in the world. Its blue counterpart is located in Morocco. It's called Chefchaouen. Some locals say that the city is painted blue to symbolize the beautiful coloring of the Mediterranean Sea. Others consider that painting their houses blue keeps them cooler when it's hot. There are even claims that painting a house blue can help keep mosquitoes away. People believe that the hue resembles the waves of the sea, which isn't a really desirable location for insects, if you think about it. Now, this construction has become the undeniable symbol of the city of love. Ah, the Tour Eiffel. I can smell a freshly baked baguette, can't you? 
Well, it turns out the Eiffel Tower has a little chromatic secret of its own. This famous French monument is painted chestnut brown these days, but it hasn't always been this color. The engineer who built the tower and also gave it its name was a man called Gustav Eiffel. He claimed that the initial paint used for the tower, a very bright red, was supposed to help protect the construction from rust, kind of like the Golden Gate Bridge does in San Francisco. But since it was built, the Eiffel Tower has had many different hues, like ochre, yellow, and several shades of brown. At one point, they even used the ombre paint effect. It made the tower look as if it was fading upon reaching the sky. I've hardly ever heard a more touching story than that of the Taiwanese rainbow grandpa. His name is Huang Yong Fu, and his story begins in the late 2000s. Given he was officially the last resident, the local authorities were just about to bring down his small village in order to make room for a modern apartment complex. To cope with his sadness, the man started painting the walls of the houses in his village. He began with drawings of birds, cats, and eventually people. In 2010, a local university student found out about this little DIY project, and the rest was history. With the help of a fundraising campaign, this little village now attracts a staggering number of tourists each year, over a million. It's no wonder the local authorities eventually renounced their plans. While we're on the subject of beautiful designs, there's a library out there that actually looks like a giant bookshelf. No, it's not a scene from a fantasy movie. Somebody actually built that. One of the facades of the Kansas City Public Library looks like an ordinary row of books lined up on a shelf. Well, not really ordinary, since the books are 25 feet tall and 9 feet wide each. You don't need to be a book nerd to want to check this one out soon. The world's largest basket isn't meant for overweight cats. It's actually a building. Yep, there's a building out there that is actually shaped like a basket. You can find it in Newark, Ohio. It was initially built to serve as headquarters for the Longoburger Company, an American producer of handcrafted wood baskets. It's also renowned among professionals as one of the best-known examples of mimetic architecture. That's a type of design where buildings are constructed to mimic their function or purpose. The building covers 180,000 square feet. It cost around $30 million to build and was completed in 1997. With seven floors and a central atrium, it also has a glass ceiling which lets natural light get inside. This immense basket is also topped with two steel handles. They're equipped with heating elements that prevent them from freezing. They also protect the glass atrium situated right below from any ice that might fall on it during the winter season. Darmstadt, Germany, there's a residential building complex built in the 1990s named the Weichspirale. It has a wonderful design, as well as an interesting story to back it up. The name literally translates to forest spiral. This might refer to the plan of the building, along with the fact that its roof is green. Not simply in color, though. This swirly building has a jaw-dropping forest on its roof, with maple and lime trees. The unique construction was completed in 2000. It has 105 apartments and more than 100 windows, each of them with its particular shape and size. With 12 floors at its highest point, the building also houses a cafe and a bar. Another interesting feature? Each corner in the construction is rounded off. Now, should you ever find yourself visiting the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, try not to miss the cube houses. These unique buildings are placed above ground level on top of a pedestrian bridge close to the city center and the Rotterdam Black metro station. In the 20th century, the city of Rotterdam was damaged. That's why later, it became the focus of new, cutting-edge architecture designs. Dutch architect Piet Blom started designing functional housing, which could also leave some room for pedestrians on the ground level. He got the idea for these houses from simple elements, such as forests and trees. Each house is placed on a hexagonal pylon, a construction made of concrete and designed to look like the trunk of a tree. Each of these pylons has a staircase that leads to well-spaced living areas. Another example of a house that looks like it has just escaped from a fairy tale is the Nautilus House. You can find it near Mexico City, Mexico. With its shell-like shape, it's also one of the first representations of bio-architecture. The man behind this unique design is Javier Senosien. He was inspired by the works of Gaudi and Frank Lloyd Wright. 
The very concept of bioarchitecture is that buildings should be constructed based on structures found in nature. It's also supposed to remind people of their local history and traditions. The Nautilus house doesn't have a lot of storage space, according to the builders. But this structure is supposed to be earthquake-resistant and maintenance-free. Not to mention hundreds of tiny rainbow-colored stained-glass windows decorating the building. Shenzhen, China. At first sight, it doesn't look like a perfect place to build one of the fanciest and tallest buildings in the world. But a company from China decided to take a chance. They had visions of building Golden Finance 117, a unique, mighty skyscraper with plenty of things super-rich people could enjoy. At that time, no one knew it would turn into one of the tallest ghost scrapers in the world, meaning it would be a skyscraper with no life, events, or people inside. The one that no one would even talk about anymore. The world has impressive tall skyscrapers. The first one was built in 1885 in Chicago. And the tallest one today is in Dubai. Then there's one in Shanghai. Another one in Mecca. And Shenzhen. Golden Finance 117 was supposed to be the fifth tallest skyscraper ever built. The construction was started 13 years ago, and at first, it all looked very promising. In 2015, the building reached its full height, 1,955 feet. But then, something mysterious happened. People deserted the skyscraper shortly after it was almost done, and the whole project has remained unfinished to this day. The company got the idea in 2008. During that period, plenty of cities across China were trying to build something impressive to get their place on the world stage. Golden Finance 117 was supposed to be a commercial and residential tower for very rich people. Italian and French-style interior design, a polo club, extensive gardens. The skyscraper was supposed to have a three-story diamond-shaped atrium at the top, with a swimming pool, sky bar, and a restaurant. And don't forget about the highest observation deck in the world, a paradise for those who could afford it. Imagine living at the top of such a skyscraper. Golden Finance 117 was expected to be habitable up to its highest point. This mixed-use skyscraper was supposed to rise 128 floors above the ground. There was a plan to turn 117 of them into commercial space and hotel, and 11 more floors were expected to be for operational and mechanical services. The building's ratio of height to width was 9.5 to 1. When you have such a high and thin tower, you have to be careful with such forces as strong winds. But the skyscraper was designed to resist all this. No wonder, with a perimeter frame of mega braces, huge tapering columns, and transfer trusses. On the surface, it all looked well. An excellent design and unique construction. But before the company started pre-sales, Authorities needed to inspect and sign off on the final product. This is a process all new developers need to go through if they want to get and keep their spot on the property market. The country wants only established and reliable companies to keep the quality levels high. Back in the day, the company that was building the skyscraper was a new player in the Chinese market. So they had to finance their project all by themselves. They couldn't start recouping their investment until each of their buildings was finished. In other words, it was tricky ever since the beginning. But they were focused on the result. If they managed to finish the entire project with no major issues, the reward would be amazing. So they started in August 2008. China survived the global financial crisis that also happened in 2008. But it still affected the market. That brought lots of pressure on the company, which is why they stopped building the skyscraper in January 2010. Things got better in 2011. That's when the company decided to continue their work, finish the tower, and get ready to sell it because the market was growing once again. But considering all the rules on the property market, the company was in a very vulnerable situation. Things were getting more and more complicated. In 2015, there was a new crisis, this time affecting the stock market. The series of unfortunate events kept happening on and off, until everyone stopped talking about the entire project. One more issue was the location. The skyscraper was being built on what used to be industrial land. 
And in the area, there weren't many wealthy people who could afford to live in such a building. The company probably hoped for people to relocate there once they finished the construction, which never happened. China generally has the biggest number of tall buildings in the whole world. There are 1,400 skyscrapers in the country. The U.S. takes second place with more than 800 high-rise buildings. Then there's Japan with over 250 skyscrapers. 2018 was the year when China built more skyscrapers than any other country in the world. 88 new buildings with a height of 656 feet or more appeared there. But because of multiple unforeseen events, Golden Finance 117 never got its chance to shine. Now it's just a ghost place everyone stopped talking about in 2018. Now, this wasn't the only case when a building remained unfinished for a long period of time. A new airport in Berlin, Germany was meant to open in June 2012. It wasn't the first project like this to miss the deadline, but it was one of the most memorable. The airport was about to open, but right before it did, inspectors found around 120,000 defects all over the place. For example, some automatic doors didn't open. There were fire safety issues. Authorities also noticed sagging roofs. About 106,000 miles of cable were wired in the wrong way, which means they couldn't turn on some lights or turn off others. Experts were trying to solve these problems for nine years. The airport was built to handle 27 million passengers a year. In 2019, over 45 million travelers passed through the two other overburdened airports in Berlin. These airports are now set to close and merge with the new one, which has started expanding. The original budget for the whole project was more than $8.2 billion, but it's likely to increase in the next few years. The idea occurred back in 1990, and it took six years just to find the right spot to build the airport. The official construction didn't start for another decade. The original code for this airport also needed to be changed since it was already in use by an airport in India. But if you design an airport in the early 2000s, will it even be compatible with the travel habits and technology in 2020 and beyond? Also, there isn't enough space for all the planes that are supposed to be there. And still, since 2020, the airport has been open and growing bigger. Meanwhile, a tower in Krakow, Poland, got the nickname Skeleton. It stood proud and tall, but its unfinished carcass indeed looked like a skeleton. At 300 feet, it's one of the tallest buildings in Krakow. The project started in 1975, but stopped because of some difficulties in the country that occurred at that time. The tower remained abandoned for a long time and changed owners several times. It was often wrapped in advertising billboards. Luckily, it didn't remain unfinished. In 2016, the latest reconstruction process started. The main goal was to turn the skyscraper into a modern office building. It's completed now. The tower consists of five office buildings, together with the main one in the center. Architects found inspiration in styles from the 1920s and 30s. There's a terrace at the top. In the future, a museum of the history of the building might appear in the skyscraper. And here's one more ghost tower, this time in Bangkok, Thailand. From the outside, you'd say it's just another part of Bangkok skyline. The skyscraper is around 75% completed. But once you take a closer look, you'll see there are plenty of interior structures missing. It was supposed to be a luxury building, but right now it's just another abandoned skyscraper. It's surrounded by a fence and doesn't look safe. The walls are covered with graffiti and there's no electricity. The building stands there as a reminder of what it could have become and draws the attention of urban explorers from all over the world. The construction process stopped when the crisis started. And now, only occasional adventurists visit the site to enjoy the magnificent view of the city and the river. There are many myths around arguably the greatest structure ever built by humans, the Great Wall of China. Some say it's so grand that it's visible from space. Others claim that you can see it from as far as the moon. Other theories suggest that the builders of the wall were left inside. Well, sorry to disappoint you, but all these impressive stories are just myths. 
But even with those stories busted, the Great Wall of China is an impressive and truly breathtaking structure. So let me tell you its true story. Today, China is one of the most populated countries in the world, counting as many as 1.4 billion residents. It's also one of the oldest nations in the world. It has 3,500 years of continuous written history. But the civilization existed long before that. There is a theory that while the European continent, for example, was most likely reached by humans from Africa, China wasn't populated by settlers that came from somewhere else. Some people believe that the Chinese civilization got formed from local Stone Age people who lived on the territory since the prehistoric period. So now, the Great Wall of China. It's truly big even by today's standard, stretching for over 13,000 miles. To imagine it better, it's almost five times the distance between New York and Los Angeles. Or even a bit greater than the distance between the North and South Poles. Even in modern times, people have never built anything close to this big. Of course, it didn't take a day to build the Great Wall of China. Two, eh, keep going. In fact, the wall was being built for centuries. Maybe you know that ancient cities had walls around them to protect themselves from invaders. Yes, Chinese cities had them too. The first Chinese emperor united the country in 220 BCE and got a brilliant but very ambitious idea to turn all city walls into one big wall that would defend the country's border against attacks from the north. A trusted general directed the construction, enrolling a big group of workers, soldiers, commoners, and convicts. Back then, the wall was built of rammed earth and wood. In some places that were strategically important, the sections of the wall overlap to provide maximum security. The walls were around 26 feet high on average. But the Great Wall didn't yet look like the construction we know today. Every next emperor would pick up the Big Wall project, strengthening and extending it, repairing, but also modernizing construction techniques. Some used bricks to build it. Others moved on to granite and marble blocks. Watchtowers and platforms weren't there from the beginning as well. They were added by Ming emperors. The watchtowers made it possible to communicate with other parts of the wall through smoke and fire messages. So the wall is quite inconsistent in terms of material, but it only adds more charm to the construction and shows how much effort and time it took. The reasons why some parts of the wall have been standing for centuries and are still in good condition is glutinous rice flour. Turns out, this sticky rice mortar is almost like cement. It's very strong and waterproof, sealing the bricks so tightly together that even sneaky weeds can't grow between them. You may also notice that some bricks have writings carved on them. They were left by the workers who were building the wall. The purpose of those writings is quality assurance. They contain such information as location, quantity, and responsible officials. So, in the case of some problems with the quality of materials or constructions, it would be known who should be held accountable for it. Recently, a research group has looked through official historical documents of the Ming Dynasty that ruled China from the 14th to the 17th centuries. They came across records of secret doors in the Great Wall. So they decided to find them. They used a flying robot to capture continuous centimeter resolution photos of the wall. They photographed 90% of the wall that was built during the Ming Dynasty and discovered the remains of over 220 secret doors along the wall. Some of them have a specific width and height that allows only one person to go through. Others are large enough to allow two horses to pass at the same time. Why are the doors there? Well, the Great Wall's main goal was to protect the country from the enemy. Building doors that could let the enemy in would undermine the whole point of having a wall. So, of course, the doors were secret passages. They perfectly matched the surroundings topographically. And the exit on the outside was camouflaged with bricks so that it was almost completely indistinguishable from the brick wall. The wall was never just a defensive wall, and it was never completely closed. It could be opened on demand. It was also a structure used for trade and commerce, communication between inside and outside the wall, and of course, for defense and spying. 
some doors were used for trade with the other side. Through smaller doors, a person would sneak out to spy on the enemy that lived on the other side. The hidden gates were also useful for a sudden attack. As you remember, some gates were camouflaged with brick on the outside. The exit was so indistinguishable that the enemy had no idea exactly where it was located. The inside entrance for Chinese soldiers was hollow, so they could walk through the wall and break the camouflaged exit gate from the inside, starting their surprise attack. Now, even though the main point was to prevent outsiders from getting into the city, the wall wasn't too effective on that matter. It could still be climbed over or marched around. So the wall was being watched at all times, and the guards gave signals to the troops if they saw the enemy approach. Also, the wall provided more time to mobilize and bulk up the country's forces or lure the enemy troops into a difficult strategic position. The construction stopped at the end of the 19th century. The wall lost its strategic and military importance due to technological advances. Over the centuries to today, only 8% of the Great Wall is in good condition, and the rest is damaged. Also, around one-third of the wall has disappeared without a trace, due to both natural erosion and human damage. I guess you could say it's now just a pretty good wall. As you remember, the first parts of the wall were built out of rammed earth and wood. These are not the most unfailing materials if we're talking about thousands of years. Also, destructive farming methods have turned large areas into a desert and contributed to erosion. Also, many bricks were taken away from the wall in the last century to be used in building farms and houses. The wall is being deconstructed stone by stone even today, but this time by tourists. Quite a few of them take a stone as a souvenir. That's a total of a lot of stones, considering that over 10 million tourists visit the Great Wall every year. Since 1987, the wall has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site highlighting that it has an outstanding importance to humanity. The wall is one of China's 56 World Heritage Sites, second place among countries with landmarks protected by UNESCO. Who's first, you ask? Well, the top spot, with 58 World Heritage Sites, belongs to Italy. And do you know that the wall isn't only a famous tourist attraction, but also the location of the Great Wall Marathon? It's a marathon that was established in 1999 and is one of the most challenging ones in the world. You guessed right, people run along the wall, including all the steps. There are three distances, so that participants can run a full marathon that is 26 miles, a half marathon that's 13 miles, or just have a fun run of 5 miles. Hey, New Year is coming, and we're going to celebrate. Pack your things, we're going to China. Yeah, you might think I'm crazy. New Year was some time ago. But Lunar New Year isn't on January 1st. It doesn't even have a regular date, because it depends on the lunar calendar. But it's usually sometime in January or February. The first day of the year is the day when the new moon appears. Then the celebration lasts for about 15 days until the moon is full. This year, Lunar New Year falls on February 12th. A whopping one-sixth of the world celebrates it, at least. The holiday is celebrated in China, where we're headed, but it's also a public holiday in many other countries. They all have different names for it, but the concept is the same – a lunar calendar celebration. Outside of Asia, the biggest celebration is held in San Francisco. It's been that way since the middle of the 19th century, when many Chinese workers arrived there during the gold rush to work in the mines. Now you can see huge Lunar New Year fireworks in tons of cities around the U.S. But getting to or moving around China isn't that easy. We gotta be careful, because right now, transportation systems are stretched to the limit. About 15 days before the New Year, and then 25 days into it, a lot of people travel somewhere by plane, train, bus, or on foot. It's traditional to visit your family for New Year. It's the largest annual human migration on the planet. Last year, in this 40-day period, there were about 3 billion total trips taken. The Lunar New Year is also called Spring Festival. It signifies the end of the winter. And wait, are you as confused as I am right now? 
spring, and February? <laughs> it's not a mistake. There are 24 solar terms in the Chinese traditional calendar, and each of them lasts about 15 days. Usually, the new year falls on the term that starts in the beginning of February, and it's called the beginning of spring. It's followed by the season's rainwater, waking of insects, and spring equinox. The traditional Chinese calendar is a bit different to the one they and the rest of the world uses. Years are counted in 60-year cycles. The cycle that's running now started in 1984. Also, their calendar is way ahead because they started counting years much earlier. This year will be 4719. Also, every year has a different zodiac sign, one of the 12 animals. The cycle of 12 starts with a rat, followed by the ox, tiger, rabbit, dragon, snake, horse, sheep, monkey, rooster, dog, and pig. Thank you. 2020 was the year of the rat, and 2021 is the year of the ox. The year of the animal you were born in is your zodiac animal. Your zodiac animal comes around every 12 years, and some say it's unlucky. But don't worry, there's a way to protect yourself. The color red. Some people wear red clothes during the year of their zodiac animal, or more likely, get a red purse or tie a red ribbon to their bag or something. A little more about red. We've finally arrived in Beijing, the capital of China. Notice how everything's decorated in red? City streets are lit up with red lanterns. Some people are dressed in red, and houses are decorated with spring festival decorations. These red decorations are a very important part of this holiday. There's no way to celebrate it without them. Red is also a big deal in Chinese culture. Just look at the flag. In China, the color red means good fortune and joy, and symbolizes good luck for the following year. Sure, some are wearing red, but the thing that really stands out is that a lot of people have new clothes on. People clean their houses before the new year, get new haircuts, and declutter their lives as best they can, all to greet the new year. The most important part of the celebration is the reunion dinner. Wherever family members are, they all try to come back home to celebrate. There's a big feast to commemorate the past year, and there's usually a lot of food. An important dish in traditional dinners is a whole fish, which signifies prosperity for the new year. Another common thing to eat are rice cakes. They're so iconic, some people even call them New Year cakes. They're made of rice flour and are very sticky. There are also dumplings, chopped meat and vegetables wrapped in dough. They're made to imitate the shape of ancient Chinese silver ingots that were used as money. So dumplings signify wealth. The rule of the evening, get stuffed full of delicious dumplings. You'll need energy. There's a long public holiday ahead, the longest one all year. Most people have 7 to 12 days of vacation, and students sometimes don't go to school for the whole month. After the main meal, some families sit together and watch the Lunar New Year Gala. It's a TV program with many different performances. There's everything – music, dancing, comedy, and drama. The gala holds the Guinness World Record for being the world's most watched TV program. Well, no wonder. China's population is more than 1.4 billion people. Younger family members get red envelopes with money from their grandparents, uncles, and other family members. Bosses give them to employees, and students might even give them to their favorite teachers. Nowadays, many of them are digital. Fireworks were accidentally invented in China more than 2,000 years ago, when someone unintentionally tossed bamboo into a fire. A thousand years later, they were reinvented by an alchemist who was trying to find the formula for eternal life. He mixed sulfur, charcoal, and potassium nitrate and heated it up. Kaboom! Packed into a piece of bamboo, it made the first firecrackers. They were traditionally used to scare away evil spirits. More than a thousand years later, China is still the world's leading producer of fireworks. If you love fireworks and the 4th of July just isn't enough, see if there are any big cities near you having Lunar New Year fireworks. They can be epic. According to tradition, the first day of the year is for all-out celebration. That's another reason why it's better to clean your house before the new year. Also, everyone has a birthday. It doesn't really matter when you were actually born. 
In China, people have a regular age and a nominal age. The real age is just the regular one starting at zero. But the nominal age is a bit different. When a person is born, he or she is considered to be one year old. Every New Year's Day, people become one year older. For example, those born on February 11th this year would just have to wait a few days to get a nominal age of two. Rice is a big part of Chinese culture, but not on the third day of the new year. That's Rice's birthday. On that day, people that are following the tradition aren't supposed to eat any rice. People usually eat a type of pasta or dumplings instead. There's another important event a few days later. The 10th day of the Lunar New Year is called the Stone Festival. On that day, people don't use stone tools. That was a big deal back in the day, when stone tools were used every day to make flour. The last, 15th day of the celebration is called the Lantern Festival. Historians say that the first lanterns were used about 2,000 years ago. Now they're a big part of China's celebration culture. On the last day of the New Year celebration, people go outside at night with their lanterns. The lantern symbolizes letting go of your old self to become a better person in the New Year. Also, many write riddles on their lanterns and solve the riddles of others when they go outside. A big part of the public celebration is the dragon dance. It's performed by a large team of dancers who hide inside a long model of a dragon. Plus, there's a whole team of drummers nearby providing the music. The dragon moves around, sometimes in a circle and sometimes like a wave. That means that the dancers have to remember the entire choreography without being able to see what's going on around them. And if the folks in the tail are moving too slowly, you shout back to them to quit dragging. Well, I thought it was fun.